There's a roof up above me I've a good place to sleep There's food on my table And shoes on my feet You gave me your love, Lord And a fine family Thank you, Lord For your blessings on me As the world looks upon me as I travel along They say I have nothing But they are so wrong In my heart I'm rejoicing How I wish they could see Thank you Lord For your blessing on me I've a roof up above me, I've a good place to sleep. There's food on my table and shoes on my feet. You gave me your love, Lord, and a fine family. For your blessings on me, I thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. I'd like you to take your Bible and open to the book of Acts. This will be our third study in the book of Acts and I have uh, tried to lay the foundation and the introduction. Uh, we pointed out that in the early centuries that the book of Acts was one of two books. You had the book of Luke and you had the book of Acts. Back in those days, they wrote down uh, their scrolls on parchment. They would have animal skins that had been cured and they would uh, make a scroll and of course if it was a big book like Luke and Acts uh, it would get so big that they would have difficulty carrying it and if they didn't have a horse or uh, a donkey or something to carry the scroll they were limited on how big uh, it could be so uh, they separated the two books as time went on. Uh, both are historical accounts. Luke was a physician, and we gave you some of the references to his uh, being a, a doctor, a medical doctor, and they went through extensive training in the first century. Uh, it was more ex extensive than the training doctors go through today. Uh, uh, one of the documents I was reading after said that before they actually became a physician they had to have over 20 years of experience in learning in classroom and on hand experience in surgeries and I know today that uh, takes doctors 8, 10, 12 years you know to specialize in a certain field and uh, I'm not saying that doctors are not as qualified as they were, but in those days there was a great deal of work that had to be done in order uh, to become a licensed physician. And uh, so we've talked about some of the most important parts of the book, that the, it was the former, verse 1 says, the former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, Theophilus means what? God lover, lover of God. We talked about, you know, uh, naming a child Theophilus and uh, being kind of a wild name, but it would be a beautiful name in other ways. But uh, Theophilus is who he was writing to, and uh, 
some have said the name was uh, made up or it was like a nickname given to this man that wanted to know and understand so he didn't use his, his name but he used this name. That's a theory but uh, no one really knows for sure since Theophilus has never been singled out as a certain individual. And notice that the book of Acts says that it was all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. So it was not just the fact that he taught wonderful principles, but it's also the fact that he did great and glorious miracles. You know, that's, that's what you have to consider when you look at Jesus Christ and the validity and the reality of everything he was, all that he accomplished, and when you look at the body of truth contained in the Gospels and the book of Acts, I don't think there's any other material that can even compare with the material of the Bible and the documentation about Christ. Uh, that's why we're not Buddhist, we're not, uh, we don't follow Muhammad, uh, we don't follow Joseph Smith or Charles Taz Russell or uh, the Mormons or whatever it may be. Uh, we follow Jesus Christ. That's what Baptists do. And uh, the first follower of Christ, one of his early followers and led the way was John the Baptist. And that name was a unique name. And it wasn't John the Baptizer. It was given that name Baptist before he ever baptized. And he was the only man with authority from God to baptize. That's why Jesus went to him. Jesus walked about 60 miles to be baptized of John. And all of the apostles had the baptism of John. So... He says until the day in which he was taken up after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Notice that these were a group of men that Jesus himself had called, had preached the gospel to, they had been saved and now he's giving them commandments. The Bible says in verse 3, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many, many infallible proofs. And yet people today mock and laugh at God and they scoff at Christ and they tell us that, you know, that we are, are, are people that have lost our minds, that we're stupid and and all sorts of things they say about you if you believe the Bible and you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'm here to tell you that believing in the Lord Jesus Christ is the only reliable uh, source in all of history that you can follow. No other man like Christ. No other man was God in flesh. No other man was the creator who laid down his life who died, was buried, and resurrected from the grave, and we're going to see he ascended to the Father. Notice it tells us that, in verse 5, John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And now here he's talking about the twelve, which were members of the first church there at Jerusalem, they were the disciples. Remember, I, I stressed this in the first lesson. The Lord's assembly, or his ecclesia, called the church, did not start on the day of Pentecost. It was accredited on the day of Pentecost. Because on the day of Pentecost, they had 120 members who were already saved and had been baptized and were doing the Lord's work. And so when these people got saved, they were added to the assembly. When you add to something, it means it already existed before you became a part of it. 
So that's very important that you understand that. Majority of people in the Christian world think that the day of Pentecost was when the church of the Lord started. And that's not the case. It started in his ministry. Now, he tells us uh, in verse 6, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Now remember, uh, the people of this day, their, their uh, politics was mainly about the power and authority of the Roman Empire. They had been subjugated to Rome. Rome had conquered them, and they had been brought into submission to Rome. And uh, remember, there's many different references made to the Roman Empire and how they uh, came and, and brought destruction. And the, the thing that the Israelites wanted most of all was for someone to destroy the great and mighty uh, kingdom of Rome. They wanted to be free. It'd be like us if, suppose, Russia were to invade America and all of us Americans were made slaves and uh, they would destroy our children and take our wives and make slaves of them and then the men, they would work in the fields and put you in prisons and all that. You can imagine the only thing that'd be on our mind Lord, when will you get rid of these people and let us be free and live a life that's decent and wholesome? So that's what Israel wanted. Their, their political ideas were all about physical Israel. And we can understand that. But the Lord says to them in these words, He said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Now that's not the answer they wanted. They wanted another answer. They wanted to hear him say, oh yeah, in 40 more years, God's going to throw down the Romans and you will be free. But that's not what he said. He said, it is not for you to know. Just as it is now, it is not for us to know the exact day when Christ will come. You remember not long ago, maybe 20 years ago, a man wrote a book, 90, 95 or 96 reasons why he was coming in 96, and then there was 98 reasons and 99 reasons, and you know, all these different books came out saying the Lord is coming. And I even heard a lot of good men that I loved and had respect for got caught up in that, and they were saying the Lord's going to come in 2000. But he didn't come. Now does that mean that he's not keeping his promises? No. His promises are just the same. The truth is we do not know the day or the hour. We know it's drawing near. I, I know that it's, it has to be close because we're in the last days. And it could occur at any time. I mean literally you could walk out your door uh, uh, after church is over and you may see a great flash of lightning and the trump of God sound and you'll see the dead in Christ rise first and we which are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I believe that with all my heart it's going to happen and uh, Jesus tells them that you, you're going to have to just occupy until I come and keep serving me and doing my will. And he says, The Father hath put all of this in his own power. It's not in our power. And I will tell you this, any time you hear a so-called preacher tell you that there is a day or an hour or a specific time when the Lord is coming, you write out from his name, false prophet. He is a false prophet. The Lord Jesus did not tell us that. None of the apostles tell us that. But the Bible does tell us the kind of time it would be like as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days 
of the coming of the Son of Man. And it tells us they were marrying, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. In other words, they were just carrying on with life. And the Lord came, just as in the day of Noah, the judgment of God fell. Now, they also go on and they, they say uh, to him, uh, in verse number 8, he says, But you'll receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. It's like saying that you'll be a witness in, in your hometown, you'll be a witness in your home city, you'll be a witness in your own state, you'll be a witness out in the countries of the world. Uh, you'll go to the uttermost parts of the earth. And that's the way our Christian life is to be. We're the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And as we live our life, we affect our home. I'm telling you, when, when people know Christ, their home will never be the same. Uh, I have a lot of people tell me, oh, you're just so crazy and foolish. You talk about how God has changed your life and what he's done. Listen, I can tell you what it's like to be in a lost home. My mom and dad weren't saved until after I was converted, and, and I lived a life of misery, and there was fighting and anger, and you name it, that went on in our home because my mom and dad did not know the Lord and did not walk in his principles. But when Christ came into our lives, our home totally changed. My dad went from being the tightest man I ever knew in my life to not being able to keep a dollar in his billfold because he would give and help and, and give to me and help me when he could. And um, when dad was a young man, uh, we used to go to the drive-in and he would go up and get him a hamburger and leave us in the car and he would eat and then come back and we'd smell it on his breath and say, Dad, why didn't you get us some? And, oh, you all don't need nothing. And then I kind of, Mom wised up and she'd send me to the drive-in after he'd go up and I caught him with a big hamburger. I said, now, Dad, you get every one of us a hamburger and french fries or I'm telling Mom. So we all got hamburgers that night. But that's just the way he was. He was tight. And, uh, but after the Lord changed his life, you know, I heard my dad look at my mom and say, Nancy, I love you. I heard my mom say, Clayton, I love you. And they would kiss each other and hug each other. And, you know, it changed their lives. And that's what God does when he comes into your family. Uh, he brings his love that changes your life. And you become a witness, you know, in various ways as you reach out with the gospel of Christ. And the Bible says... When he had spoken these things in verse 9, while they beheld, he was taken up. If you underline in your Bible, underline those three words, was taken up. And uh, there is a lot of correlation with the, uh, the, uh, the things the Bible talks about, the great calling away. Now the word rapture is not in the Bible. But it doesn't mean that the rapture is not taught. It's called the great catching away or the great calling away. So Jesus, while they beheld him, was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. You know, March is the month to fly kites. And when I was a boy, I couldn't wait until March. And I'd get me a kite and I'd put me a big long tail on it and I'd fly that kite, and it'd get up real high, and then when you really got it up there, you would lose sight of it. You know, the clouds would block it, and you'd go, wow, I can't even see it. And, uh, you know, eventually your string would break or something would happen, but you'd get that thing so high, and I can just imagine when they were watching the Lord, he just began to rise. And they watched as he went higher and higher and higher. And then, wow, he's gone. And they're all looking up. Hey, I think I still see him. I think I see a foot or a toe. No, no, he's gone. 
He's totally gone. He's gone into the heavens. And he says, in that same manner, he will come. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Now I'm going to give you a little tidbit here if you want to check this out. These two men that stood by them in white apparel are mentioned several times in the Bible. And they're always mentioned in like the resurrection, the ascension, the transfiguration. And here it says these two men stood by them in white apparel. Now no doubt these, these were some sort of angelic beings or could have been, uh, uh, you know, some say Moses and Elijah. We don't know exactly who they were. But it says, which also said, you men of Galilee, why stand you gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Now that is truth. That is absolute gospel truth. The same Jesus that you saw taken into heaven will so come again in the same manner as you saw him go into heaven. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. You know, a lot of us still today, we uh, use olive oil. And uh, Mount Olivet, or that it's mentioned here, was where the Mount of Olives was. And uh, they grew olives for, you know, they've grown them for at least 4,000 years, according to re recorded history. And uh, I used to, and still I don't have a great taste for olives. Some people love them, but, you know, when I would get a salad and then have olives, I'd push them off to the side. But now that I've learned that olives are so good for you, I, I chew them and eat them and get them down, and I drink olive oil daily to help me with different functions in my body. I think uh, these things can be a blessing, but it mentions the Mount of Olives uh, where he was taken up. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode. Now this, this is the, the apostles, the members of that first church. They abode both Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, uh, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon, Zealots, and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer, excuse me, supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about, if you underline in your Bible, were about 120. And that's the number of members of that first church. So when somebody comes up to you and says, well, don't you know that on the day of Pentecost, the Lord's church was started? And you say, uh, pardon me, but have you read verse 15 of chapter 1? They already had 120 members. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Remember that Judas, he saw the miracles, he heard the preaching. I mean, he heard the gospel from the mouth of our Lord. I mean, how many folks had that opportunity? Only a very few. And he was one of them. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. He had, we know that he was a thief, because the Bible tells us that, that he bore the bag and he was a thief. And uh, you, you imagine, just to add insult to injury, uh, you know, being the kind of man he was, betraying our Lord, 
And then he was stealing money all the time and putting it aside to, to buy things. You might want to check them. She almost lost her balance. Uh, I was talking to Brother Wilson. Sorry. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem in so much as that field is called in their proper tongue, Akeldama, that is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. Wherefore of these men which was accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed to Joseph called uh, Barsabas and uh, who was surnamed Justus and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knoweth the hearts of all men, show whether these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part in uh, this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression failed, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias. And he was numbered with the 11 apostles. That made 12. So Judas was no longer part of that uh, apostleship. And they chose one to take his place. How would they do that? They voted. They cast lots. That means they one wrote down, I believe this man, I believe that man. They prayed about it. And God uh, had them elect or choose the one who would be the leader. Uh, same is true today when a pastor, uh, a church calls a pastor or uh, whatever it may be, the church is uh, in charge of doing that. I don't think that a former pastor should try to dictate what a church does. I've seen that happen. I don't think it's right. Uh, in all the churches where I pastored, when I resigned, I left so that the church could do its own bidding and call the man that they wanted. Because a pastor can get in the way. Uh, and, and even though you'd think a pastor would, you know, be there to guide and so forth, I think it's better that, uh, that the church uh, stand on its two feet and pray and ask God to guide them in that respect. So we see that this, all these things were of great importance. Jesus had given them a mission, and now they were going to be accredited. The day of Pentecost was going to come, and it did come just as he said. We dealt with this last week in depth, that there were cloven tongues of fire that sat on each of their heads, and they all spoke known languages. They heard that language in their own tongue and were able to interpret what was being said. Uh, this is not at all like the tongue speaking that Pentecostalism and holiness uh, teaches in churches today. They, uh, I remember when I was a young man, uh, went forward in a Pentecostal holiness church uh, in uh, Lee Rose, Owsley County, and uh, they told me that, you know, I needed, after I got saved, I had to go up and pray through. So I asked them, I said, how I get saved? And they said, will you pray through? So they had this altar, and everybody got on their knees, and you would pray and pray and pray. And I remember saying, well, how long do I need to pray? And he said, we don't know until you pray through. And I said, well, I, I prayed and I prayed. I, I was there for at least 30 minutes, and that's a long time for a boy. And, uh, and then after I prayed a while, he said, I think you prayed through. And then he got me up, and they said, now we're going to baptize you. And they baptized me in the, in the river. And 
Then they kept telling me, now the next thing you need to do is speak in tongues. And uh, everybody would do it, and they'd say, okay, now you need to speak in tongues if you're really saved. And, and I'm sorry to say this, but I did try to fake it a few times. I tried to, you know, do what they were doing, but I knew it was, it was fake. It wasn't real. And then when I, after I got saved and I read what the Bible teaches, that is not what God taught his disciples, and it's not something that we should do in this day. That was a gift that happened one time. It happened on the day of Pentecost. It'll never be repeated again. Now, when we've had missionaries come here and preach and they speak uh, maybe Spanish or they speak, uh, uh, you know, another language, uh, we have, you know, they interpret. Uh, when, uh, when we've had in different churches men, like I remember once we had a man and he couldn't speak English, he spoke Spanish, so they interpreted. When I went to Peru and uh, the Virgin Islands and Trinidad, different places where they would speak other languages, especially in Peru, uh, I would preach and the, uh, the preacher there would interpret what I was saying. So it wasn't just me saying words. I was preaching in English and he was interpreting it in Spanish to the people. And this is what happened on the day of Pentecost. You know that the Lord loves his people, and we see this example through the book of Acts. Uh, he calls his people in Deuteronomy 7 his uh, treasure, his treasured possession, and uh, he had a people, and he's been saving those people from the beginning. And uh, the Lord has many great future blessings for us. You know, there are lots of wonderful things ahead. The second coming of Christ. God is going to destroy this earth. And he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And new Jerusalem is going to come down from heaven and rest upon a new earth. When the book of Revelation closes, uh, we see new Jerusalem coming down. And there we will worship our Lord and serve him through all eternity. We see that uh, he has made it known that we cannot know the exact day of the coming of the Lord, but we're to be witnesses. All through the book of Acts, this uh, idea of being a witness is paramount. I mean, it's just, uh, let me give you a few so you can kind of get a taste of it. In chapter 1, verse 22, beginning from the baptism of John and that same day he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. That's what we are. We're witnesses. We tell people all the time about uh, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, that, that he died, that he was buried and raised from the dead. And this day and time, I, I, we get mocked so much. Uh, people just mock us all the time. And, uh, but there are some that love the truth. And we thank God for those that love the truth and love his word, but that's what we're to do. And we're not to be ashamed. I don't care what people do. Uh, folks tell us that uh, the time is coming when we'll be arrested for sharing the gospel. There's a video on YouTube of a man that was preaching on the street, and they told him, you stop preaching or you're going to jail. And he kept right on preaching. And they took him down to the ground, handcuffed him, and hauled him off to jail for preaching the gospel. I don't know if you've heard this, but in Israel, uh, legislation is being worked on right now that if any person goes to Israel and shares the gospel or tries to uh, tell a person about Christ, uh, they call it being a proselyte, you go to jail for one year. One year for just simply talking about Jesus and telling another person that they can be saved by trusting in Him. 
And you know, right here in, in Fayette County, it's, it's really bad right now. Many times I've made attempts to go out and witness in these homes, and uh, they won't open the doors, or people will call the police. Uh, I've had the police call me on two occasions and say, you know, you're not allowed to go door to door and witness to people. And I don't want to go to jail, but, uh, you know, it's just getting so difficult. Now, you can take in other places it's not so uh, uh, regulated, but the bigger the town gets and the more hostile they are toward Christ, the more the problems are that they will try to stop this. And we see... Uh, in chapter 2, verse 32, this Jesus hath God raised up, wherefore we all are witnesses. Now we didn't see him, we weren't there, but we believe by faith. In chapter 3 and verse 15, the Bible says these words, chapter 3 and verse 15, it says, And killed the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And all through it, the scriptures it goes from 532 to 758 to 1039 and 41 and 1331, 22, 15, 22, 26, and 16. All of these verses say that we are to be witnesses, both in Jerusalem and Judea and uh, to the uttermost parts of the earth. That's what God has called us to do, and that's what we try to do all the time. Uh, right now, I need some help uh, trying to put together all of the articles that I've written on Facebook. Uh, I've written uh, hundreds of articles and things over the years, and I have a man who can speak three languages, and he wants to translate uh, all of those articles and put them in uh, Spanish. And uh, I've given him the permission. I just need to get all that together and uh, send it to him so he can translate it all and, and we can send it to different parts of the world uh, and he uh, uh, he's just the man he loves the truth he's a Baptist uh, I met him many many years ago in, in uh, uh, over in Peru I met some of his family too and so uh, he loves the Lord and that would be a great way to reach out just like many other churches have done Brian Station does this and a lot of different churches. Uh, a brother up in uh, Florence, Kentucky, uh, he prints extensively and shares the gospel. And we're to carry that message to the very ends of the earth. Luke uh, was a man who continually gave uh, a witness to the fact that Christ had died, was buried, and raised up from the dead. And the ascension that we've just studied tonight is a mandate to the apostles to be witnesses. Jesus ascended from the earth and disappeared into the heavens. And the sight of Jesus being enveloped in the clouds is reminiscent of the Shekinah glory of God. This was the symbol of the glorious divine presence that God was among his people. And we see this throughout Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. We see this mentioned in Matthew 16, 19, uh, and Mark as well. As many believe that this is a, uh, a scripture, it's one of the oldest manuscripts that speak of his ascension. And uh, we see this is such a vital point to the truth. Jesus was no ordinary man. Uh, he was indeed the Son of God, and He was God in flesh. Verse 19 of chapter 3 
uh, it says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God hath spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. One of the greatest things that ever happened in my life was the day when I heard the gospel. It changed my whole life. I was, I was uh, at a point in life where I didn't know what to do. I had graduated from high school, and uh, I didn't know what to do with my life. I wasn't saved. And uh, my mom, even though she was not saved at the time, she said, Son, uh, I can see that you have a lot of problems in your life, and you're very troubled. And she said, going to church would be a good thing for you. And I said, Mom, I don't want to go to church. She said, you ought to go, son. And in fact, she got up and cooked this big breakfast. She made fried potatoes, tomato gravy, biscuits, and eggs. And, and I mean, I could smell it cooking. And I got up and she said, uh, you can eat if you'll go to church today. Yeah. <laughs> and I said... Mom, I, I want to eat. She said, well, you got to go to church. And I said, all right. And so I got ready that day, and I hadn't been in a church house in years. And that morning, the pastor preached from Romans 10, and God opened my heart, and the Lord saved me. And my whole life was turned around, just like yours. Oh, the, oh, the joy and the blessings of the Lord. Where would we be today without him? What would we be pursuing? Our lives would have been wasted without knowing Christ. Because listen, it doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how powerful and famous you may be. If you don't know Christ, when death comes, what a sad ending to die without Christ. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. Ask, O oh Father, you'll bless now. And Lord, cause us to go out and share the message of the gospel and to not be ashamed to let people know what the Lord has done in our lives. In your name I pray, the Lord Jesus. Amen.